Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of the Prove Me Wrong podcast. Once again, and as always, I'm your host, Pete Lieb. I've got a great show lined up for you once again tonight, and uh, it's really a topic that's got legs. We're going to talk about the demotivations, the methods, and the mythology of serial killers. And my guest tonight will be Dr. Peter Vronsky. Peter is an author, filmmaker, and investigative historian. Uh, he holds a PhD from the University of Toronto in criminal justice, history, and espionage in international relations. He is the author of several best-selling books on the history and psycho psychopathology of serial homicide and its investigation. His books include Serial Killers, The Method and Madness of Monsters, Female Serial Killers, How and Why Women Become Monsters, and his newest book, Son of Cain, A History of Serial Killers from the Stone Age to the Present. Mr. Vronsky began writing about serial killers after he briefly and randomly encountered uh, a serial killer himself uh, before they were apprehended in New York City in 1979 and another in Moscow in 1990. Uh, his websites include petervronsky.org, serialkillerchronicles.com, investigativehistory.com, sons of Cain, serialkillers.com, among others. And you can also find his books on amazon.com. So once again, welcome Dr. Vronsky to the program. Thanks, Peter. Prove me wrong. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so if you could start us off with this interaction that I talked about briefly in the, in the bio here, you had a, a run in with a serial killer prior to their abduction. What happened? Um, well, indeed, um, just randomly as I was trying to check into a uh, hotel in New York City, um, I encountered quite a notorious serial killer as he was fleeing the scene of a double murder where he had uh, beheaded two women, um, set their torsos on, on fire, uh, packed their heads as well as their severed hands into a um, bag and and was fleeing the hotel as I was coming in. And, and so we had this brief um, encounter in the elevator doors. Of course, at that moment, I, I didn't know he was a serial killer. It, right. it, it took me quite a while. I, I didn't even know there was a homicide. Um, about 10 minutes after I went into the hotel, um, you know, there was an alarm and the hotel was evacuated. I, uh, you know, I, I was leaving um, just as the fire department was coming in. So I decided not to stay there. I, I went somewhere else. Um, and the next morning, I read in the newspapers what had actually occurred. Uh -huh. uh, so, but I didn't think of the guy that I had run into. Uh, it would be at least a year later that I see his picture and, and suddenly I realize, you know, that's the guy had annoyed me because he held up the elevator. Right. Which, which yeah. is why I kind of gave him a really hard look as, as the elevator came down and the doors opened. So it's, it's, you know, it was a completely random encounter. And, and of course, it shapes uh -huh. the work I'll do because at that moment, the term serial killer had not, had not been used yet in kind of the public domain. I know, um, you know, FBI profilers were kind of using that term, mm -hmm. but it wasn't really in the, as I say, in 1979, it wasn't in the public domain. So just the idea of what a serial killer is and the idea that normal looking people that you could run into on the elevator could be a serial killer. It just never entered my, my, my consciousness that way. So, um, you know, with that event, I kind of became aware of, of, of this kind of phenomenon that at that point had different names. I mean, we used to call them recreational killers, uh, stranger on stranger killers. Uh, sometimes we refer to them even as uh, mass killers. And of course, now that has a completely different right, meaning than right. it did back then. So that kind of began my lifelong interest in, in, in serial killers. And, and of course, when I ran into a second one, as a journalist um, in 1990, that really got me thinking because now I was I was wondering, you know, what are the mathematical odds 
of running into you know no two doubt. random serial killers. But but as I started writing my book, I mean I I would write my book some twenty years, twenty five years later. Uh, you know, as they say, write what you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought, you know, if I if I write a book that I hope will sell, um, what do I know? Well, I had these two random encounters with serial killers. Let's find out more. Um, and and so as I you know as I started researching the book, I realized that lots of people had these kinds of random encounters, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, probably most notoriously Rosalind Carter. Uh, the first lady, Jimmy, President Jimmy Carter's wife, uh, was hosted by John Wayne Gacy in Chicago. Oh, wow. Um, you, you know, when he was a, a con Polish Constitution Day uh, precinct parade captain. So my story kind of began to look a little bit, um, you know, limp compared to Rosalind Carter's day with 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 john wayne gacy and of course uh, jeffrey dahmer mm -hmm. snuck into the office of vice of vice president uh mondale uh you know i mean i guess the jimmy carter administration was rife with with serial killer encounters so you you mentioned the word phenomenon and that really kind of fits the 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 serial killer ideal has just has legs i mean it, it, what is the public fascination with serial killers I mean, Ted Bundy's been dead now for 30 years, yeah. and he'll have a, a television special pretty much every year. And actually, I've, I've talked to uh, Stephen Michaud myself about his book, that Conversations with a Killer, and it was one of the, the biggest you know, the shows that we've had. Uh, television networks almost solely dedicated to these killers. Dahmer had a movie. Women worship them somehow. Seemingly sane women worship these killers, marry them in prison. What is it that... What is it about the idea of a serial killer that has that holds so much uh, mystique and and what makes a, a killer more attractive to a woman? What do you think that is? Well, um, that's a lot of questions. It is. One, I'm in, sorry. In one question, yeah. and, and indeed, you're right. Um, certainly, the majority of my um, readers are are women, judging by you know the kind of letters I I, I, I get. Yeah. Um, so I've never understood exactly why, um, you know, female readers particularly are drawn to, I, I guess it's this kind of almost reassurance that it's not happening to me, um, a kind of honing of one's maybe protective instinct, one's defensive instincts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, women live often kind of in, a, in, in you know, a state of fear from strangers. And, and of course, a serial killer is um, the ultimate bad stranger yeah. that one can get confronted with. Although, um, you know, some end up marrying serial killers or are fathered by serial killers. And, and so sometimes it's not a stranger. Sometimes it's your husband, your father, your brother. Right. Could be a serial killer. Um, I think that's what fascinates us is is they are our um, our monsters, and I, I think the monster that we used to think was a monster were actually serial killers, and of course that's werewolves. Um, uh, you know the 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 kind of good neighbor mm -hmm. uh, that when the full moon comes turns into uh, you know this destructive. A mutilating serial killer and you know when I looked at um, in Sons of Cain when I looked at um, kind of a longer look back into the history of serial killers um, I started looking at trials of, of werewolves um, in the Renaissance era between 1450 1650 and when I looked at what they were accused of I suddenly realized that these werewolves are actually serial killers. Um, you know, some of them are accused of, while they're not a werewolf, that um, they're helping to try to find the missing victim, uh, that often uh, neighbors know them, uh, they're prominent in their community. 
and 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 the only thing is is that they turn into this werewolf uh but but other than that everything that they do and everything that they're described as doing and and, and their kind of pathology uh when they're not a werewolf actually is very much a description of the kind of modern pathology that we see in in the serial killer kind of a uh, you know a a, a psycho uh, psychopathic um uh, charisma mm -hmm. a a ability to move inside um the community and and as well um you know you had the disorganized werewolves as well those uh, that kind of lived on the edges of um, a community that were uh, vagrants that that kind of didn't fit in, um, and 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 so all these modern pathologies that we understand about serial killers were very evident in these trial transcripts, right down um, to insanity pleas. Except the insanity plea in those days, if if, if you were tried as a werewolf there was a kind of a triple test as opposed to a double test the way mm -hmm. we have now. Um, the, the, the question was, and, and physicians would come in to testify, the question was, was whether the accused um, was acting in the way he was acting because he believed that he was a werewolf and did what werewolves were expected to do. That was option one. Or option two was that he was faking that he believed he was a serial killer in the hope of getting an insanity decision. Our option three is that he actually is a werewolf. Um, and, and, and so we're now reduced to option two. You know, is he really insane or is he faking insanity? Right. Um, so all that was a part of the judicial process, as I say, usually not carried out by the state, but by the church. These were often ecclesiastical trials that went hand in hand with witchcraft trials. So you, you mentioned, and it's weird that you, that you went with the werewolves, because I actually had a, a discussion with somebody who talked about, was talking about shapeshifters, which is essentially a, a werewolf, and, and they classified um, serial killers potentially as shapeshifters, meaning, you know, maybe your, maybe your physical... Body doesn't right. change, but you you shift something inside of you shifts and you okay. do become yeah. someone else. So you have that that public facing uh, persona, uh, the John Wayne Gacy, you know, um, very public you know, everyday man persona. But then you when needed, you shape shift into something completely different. And, Indeed. you know, and, and there have been um, stories about Ted Bundy being that way as well, that sometimes, you know, his physical characteristics would would change, you know, even to the point where his eyes would go black and he would look differently and he'd have, a, you know, a weird um, vein that would pop out on his head. So he physically changed. So it's interesting that that you would say, you know, you equate that to werewolves or shapeshifters, kind of the same thing. When you're talking about Sons of Cain and, and the the roots of serial killing from the Stone Age, um, yes. what what are some kind of what are some of the earliest known serial killers? Because it seems to me that life was a lot cheaper, you know, back in the day. And, and you could be a lord. Yes. You could be you could have uh, dominion over your land yes. and you could essentially you could kill people without repercussion. And, you, and, and well, actually, you couldn't. Yeah, um, because when you look at, uh, you know, two classic names come up, of course, uh, Gilles de Ray in France, who, who you know, uh, was accused of murdering uh, multiples of children. Um, and of course, Elizabeth Bathory, the blood right. countess, um, in, um, in Hungary, essentially, um, about, I think, 200 years after Gilles de Ray or 100 years after Gilles, Gilles de Ray. So those are often, when you read serial killer kind of historical literature, they're often kind of brought up as our first serial killers. And mm -hmm. um, their power to kill, even though they were um, aristocrats and, and nobles, um, they did not have the power to kill the way, say, Caligula might. Okay. You know? Um, however, if you read Caligula's contemporaries, um, a lot of his contemporaries, like Seneca, writes about Caligula 
how abnormal Caligula's killing is. Um, you know, that he likes to kill at night, that he can't wait till uh, daytime. So even these, uh, you know, a real powerful aristocrats who had that power and, and we kind of say, well, that's not really serial killing. That's, you know, people with power in those days had that kind of power over life and death. It's not necessarily the case. Certainly contemporaries of guys like Nero, Caligula saw their killing as unusually sadistic, even right. for, a, for a Roman emperor. Um, and, and so in the same case with Gilles de Rey and, and uh, Elizabeth Tory, um, her fellow aristocrats, for example, were shocked um, at her ill treatment of her servants. Uh, so so uh, Was she these ever... were already unusual cases dis despite of their power. Were they ever um, punished by for that? I mean, was she ever... Both of them were, yes. Both of them were. Uh, um, uh, Gilles de Rey was executed. He was um, hung uh -huh. um, while Elizabeth Batory was walled in uh, oh. alive into her uh, chambers. So indeed, they were both punished. And again, both were punished first by ecclesiastical courts. Um, the accusations were not necessarily uh, murder, but, but uh, sorcery. That's certainly Gilles de Rey's crimes were sorcery mm -hmm. and, and that he killed these children in the practice of, of, of sorcery. So when you're talking about when your first uh, your first encounter in 1979 and you had mentioned that at the time there really wasn't a term for what that person was. There were some there were a couple of different things being kicked around, but yep. nothing had really been solidified. What was the history behind the term serial killer? I mean, when did they come up with that and start affixing that to people? Well, um, you know, it's a controversial uh, question, but uh, the, the majority of the evidence points uh, to Robert Resler, the FBI, mm -hmm. you know, one of the mine hunters, one yes. of the uh, early guys that went in to meet uh, and interview serial killers, along with, you know, John Douglas and the forensic nurse, um, Burgess. Mm -hmm. um, and so Resler states that he used that term in a lecture in England uh, in the mid-1970s, and that he was inspired uh, by movie serials, where in a movie serial, um, at the end of that episode, rather than kind of a resolution at the end of the episode, you're left kind of wanting more. Um, it's kind of incomplete. And, and, and so Ressler thought that that term serial uh, kind of mathematically, uh, you know, what it describes, mm -hmm. fit was apt, but plus the kind of um, pathology that, that he imagined serial killers, this kind of circular addiction, he said was similar to what audiences experience when they used to go to that Saturday afternoon serial. Um, and, and so he kind of put a claim on, on that he introduced that term. Right. So the term begins to kind of enter into public discourse in the New York Times um, in May of 1981. Uh, I, I see that term appear there mm -hmm. to describe Wayne Williams in Atlanta as a, as a serial murderer and those uh, killings as uh, serial killings. And, and, right. and so once it gets into the New York Times, it, it starts just proliferating throughout media, literature, and, and so forth. So May of 1981, roughly, is when the term really gets incorporated, despite the fact that other people advanced it, used it, but, but it never caught on until then. So I, I know that there is an entire history of, of people prior to the term serial killer. Yeah. What would you consider to be the height of the the serial killer phenomena. What, is there a time frame that you think is absolutely. really the golden age? Absolutely. Yes, yeah, absolutely. The so-called uh, what what uh, Harold Schechter has has uh, called the um, the golden age of uh -huh. serial murder. Uh, so we're talking roughly a thirty-year period between nineteen seventy and uh, 2000, say 1970 to 1999. Okay. Um, in that 30 years, um, about 83% of 
known American serial killers in the 20th century, they made their appearance in that, that small 30 year era. So wow. that's really the height. And, and even today, when you look at all those serial killer shows on television, most of them, I would say 80% of them go back to those three decades. I mean, as you, as you pointed out, you know, Ted Bundy, certainly, you know, all roads in serial murder lead to Ted Bundy, but um, that John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer, um, the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez um, era of serial killers continues to somehow um, obsess us in the way that newer serial killers, and I, you know, I don't know exactly why, but newer serial killers don't seem to capture our imaginations um, in the way that generation did. Um, you know, maybe because we've kind of become accustomed to them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have spectacular serial killers in, in the 2000s ranging, uh, you know, from, from um, you know, the trial of the dating game uh, killer, although actually... You know, he's a golden era serial killer, right, right. too. Um, uh, you know, so, you know, Israel Keys, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, but but somehow, you know, you have a whole new generation of people who weren't even born uh, when Ted Bundy was doing his stuff, who are now just for the first time being introduced, by you know, to Ted Bundy. Could, uh, could that be um, just maybe a byproduct of some, of the emergence of national media, as it really, as the national media really took off, as it, you know, with uh, television and things like that? You know, there were people before the sixties. I mean, Ed Gein was was pretty brutal, right beforehand, and didn't you? Wasn't Richard yeah. Richard Speck was before that, and there were there yeah. were a lot of serial killers prior, but they oh, didn't absolutely. get the, yeah. they didn't get the same kind of of national attention that like you said well they didn't back then because we didn't know what to call them right? okay so that you know that's certainly one part um and 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 again just the numbers yeah were not there i mean even if we triple the numbers of known serial killers in the 1950s 1960s they still won't come anywhere near to the phenomenal numbers that we had in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. That 30-year period, it was really just a, a, an epidemic of serial killers. In fact, my new book, American Serial Killers, The Epidemic Years, mm -hmm. uh, is going to come out in December, and, and I specifically focused on kind of that rise of serial murder from about 1950 um, up until you know, the end of 1990s. I kind of described Jeffrey Dahmer as really our last golden age serial killer. I mean, you know, who comes after Jeffrey Dahmer? Yeah, I don't know. I, I remember yeah, exactly. Jeffrey Dahmer. I was a teenager. I was a teenager when he was captured. So I remember that. Um, that was actually, yeah, that was the last one that I re would remember for sure. Yeah, yeah. he's kind of the last so-called celebrity serial killer. Um, you know, the BTK killer, uh, of course, he's captured, what, uh, 2005, mm -hmm. early 2005. Um, but he, you know, after kinda... Jeffrey Dahmer, really, the BTK killer was the one that made national news. But, you know, he was killing in the 70s, right. 80s as well. Yeah, so, and he was kind of dormant at that point, wasn't it? It was almost like where yeah, they, yeah, they he caught was him. Just as, yeah, that's like as the Golden the State. Green River killer, the Golden yeah. State. Uh, killer all these guys right now that are making headlines are still from that old generation of, of, of serial killers and and you just don't take as much interest in the golden state killer who's now 80 years old or 75 years old and he hasn't committed a murder potentially in 20 years whereas yes. Dahmer was active at the moment i mean they, when they caught him he was active at that time that's so right you had right. that that fear going on gripping them and they caught him and, and that that was on amazing on top of that so yes. yeah, it's not the same feeling to me as as BTK or Golden State, which yeah, we we went out, we went back, and I, I do want to talk about uh, the Golden State and how they caught him because I think that's yeah that's amazing, but that was so long ago and they hadn't been active. Uh, so can I let me ask you this because we're talking about the Golden Age. So what do we think or what do you think are some of the common triggers that created all of those eighty three percent of our serial killers during that time span? Do you have any idea? 
I I I I have some ideas. Um, uh -huh. One of them, I think, is you got to look at the fathers and the generation of fathers that brought up those golden age serial killers, um, and and so they're brought up in a those fathers were kind of conditioned by the depression and then by the second world war um and and the more i read about serial killers from that era um i kept coming across reports how you know their fathers came back from the second world war traumatized mm -hmm. with um you know what we today call ptsd but of course that term wasn't there um and 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 when i started looking at what our um, Second World War veterans had experienced, it's nothing like what we think it was or the way it was shown to us in documentaries or, or, or movies. It right. was pretty brutal. And th unlike Vietnam War veterans, for example, who um, were kind of encouraged to talk it out once PTSD was was diagnosed. There was no such diagnose for for World War II veterans, and so a lot of World War II veterans just bottled it up. Um, you hear often recollections of people about their father from or their grandfather from World War II just mm -hmm. remaining in kind of sullen silence. Um, they just had to suck it up. Uh, by themselves, essentially. So, right. so that's the one element. So you kind of have this disconnect between sons and, and fathers, um, you know, from, you know, from Dennis Radar um, to um, Edmund Kemper, mm -hmm. right? Um, their fathers came back, uh, uh, you know, Arthur Shawcross, their fathers came back seriously fucked up from that war okay. uh, to a much greater extent than we acknowledge. So that's one element. The second element, of course, is um, a popular literature that celebrated um, the abduction, torture, and rape of, of women um, from uh, true detective magazines to kind of men, uh, men's adventure magazines. Um, and, and this was not kind of, um, you know, an adult magazine adult magazine racks or adult bookstores this was mainstream um you know these magazines which begin the fbi begins reporting how they're finding these magazines in the possession of serial killers or serial killers are reporting how they first start getting a a, a kind of tickling of their fantasy when they're young when they see these magazines again mm -hmm. dennis radar uh, describes how he found the True Detective magazine in his father's um, uh, truck and, and how it just turned him on, you know. And, 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 of course, he's referring to what he was seeing in the True Detective magazine um, to the... the, the um, it was a serial killer called the Glamour Girl Killer in, in, in um, California. Um, just trying to remember his last name... Um, Harvey was this person just slips out of my mind for a second. Nonetheless, okay. he was actually um, abducting amateur models um, using a ruse that he was shooting a true crime magazine cover. And, and so he would pose them, uh, tying them up as women were tied up in these magazines. Uh, but then actually he went on to, to rape and kill them. Um, inside his own magazine cover. Um, moreover, often these magazine covers, if, if you look at them, the, the, the female is always in a state of fear. She's, something is about to happen to her, and she's looking off the magazine cover towards the reader, towards the buyer, towards mm -hmm. whoever has that magazine. So the, that fantasy kind of, in, in that photo, places the viewer incorporates them into that fantasy. Um, so, so, you know, those two elements are, are I think, a good beginning to explain, um, you know, this kind of rise of serial murder as at the same time, we're also having a, 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 an increase in general violence and disorder in society as we get into the 1960s. Everything 
from marriage to parental authority to government authority um, comes under question. You know, by by the 1970s, we don't trust anybody after Watergate. Um, you know, from the JFK assassination to um, the war in Vietnam to Charlie Manson to um, uh, you know everything that happened in the in the in the 60s also adds, um, I think, to that general climate in which serial killers um, thrived and, and, and kind of found their their own place. What about the relationship between, and I, I hear it a lot, between the killers and their and their mothers, their overbearing yeah. mother? Uh, is that yes. another uh, deciding factor? It's 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 well, it's not a deciding factor, but it is a frequent factor. And, mm -hmm. and the theory there is, of course, is that um, every child, male child, eventually needs to negotiate his own independence from his mother. Uh, and if the mother is particularly overbearing or overprotective, um, she frustrates this child. And then the child develops a rage towards the female figure that was frustrating him. So, so that's the theory. Um, you know, not all serial killers have overbearing mothers, uh, but, but, but many certainly do. I mean, you've constantly come ac uh, uh, across that. And often that's combined with the absence of a father figure as well. Uh, a huge number of serial killers, by the time they're, um, I think, 12 years old, their father has already left. Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of serial killers are lacking a, a, a male role model. Um, and of course, that would mean essentially that the mother has essentially become the right. dominant family figure as well. Um, so it's not necessarily, you know, a psychological thing in the mother, you know, um, but certainly when you read again that, you know, the case of Ed, you know, Ed and Kemper is, right. uh, you know, the ultimate uh, mother story. So w I guess my, my, my thing here is th these are table setters because I, mean, I mean, there are millions of people who come from homes where the father is absent or is distant yeah. and have overbearing moms. Who don't kill get, people, you know, who yeah, don't who are, who are raped and killed, as, uh, uh, raped and, and beaten as children, sexually right. abused, and they don't become serial killers. Exactly. So, so there has exactly. to be some, some some predilection to to it anyway. There has to be some defect there as well. But then when you kind of layer those other factors on, that's when you really have potential trouble. Right. Yeah. After all these years, we still don't know what the X factor is. Yeah. Um, and as I like to say, um, I think it's still in the game a little bit too early for us just to write off old fashioned biblical evil. Yeah. Well, and, and the other whatever that is. And, and I guess part of the other problem is we have to rely on what could potentially be a, an unreliable narrator it, it, because because a lot of the information we get. They're they're telling us, you know, right? They're self-reporting, so, right? So John Douglas and and um, going in there and talking to Kemper or talking to uh, Brutos or talking to some of these other individuals, uh, you know, the Ted Bundys of the world. We have to listen to what they're saying, and they're liars by nature. You know, they, they've been sure. lying to everybody around them. They've been lying That's to, right. uh, to, so they're liars by nature. So we now have to believe what they say because we need something. We need something from them because what they do is is illogical and, and horrific. Yes. So, um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult. That's the problem is that we can say that these are the t table setters, but we have no way of really measuring it scientifically, I, I think. Um, but you know, that's just, a, that's not really a, a question. It's just a statement, I guess. It's always something that's always kind of got to me. Yeah, um, we really know very little about it in the 20 years. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I wrote Method and Madness in 2004, right? And, right. and and so, you know, we're looking at 16 years since I've written that book and, and, and so many new theories have emerged and not one is conclusive. So right. um, to this day, we really still don't understand serial murder. I, I kind of written off the psychopathology. I've gone back to, um, you know, Lombroso, who was discredited at the end of the 19th century. Um, he suggested that... Um, you know, there's there's a kind of a criminal, uh, born criminal, mm -hmm. um, and and I think we're all born criminals. Um, I think we're all born potential cannibals, yeah. murderers, um, and rapists uh, because 
you know, um, aggression and reproduction at any cost is necessary in any species for its survival. Mm -hmm. uh, what I describe as the four Fs, right? Uh, fleeing, fighting, feeding, and fucking. <laughs> right. right? Um, if we don't do one of those things, even if a cockroach, if cockroaches stop doing one of those things, very quickly, there'll be no more cockroaches. And I think the same thing applied to humans prior to our becoming civilized. And, and, and so I think these instincts are very deeply ingrained mm -hmm. in us. Um, and, and, you know, we've been civilized for approximately 12,000 to 15,000 years out of about roughly a million years that various hominid species um, existed, right? So 15,000 out of a million is not a lot of time for us to kind of get our brains right. rewired. Um, and, and so I think we're all born with those natural instincts, but we get, you know, with, with good upbringing, good parenting, a stable environment, those instincts are... Uh, kind of conditioned out of us. Oh, okay. So I think what a serial killer is, is, is one who cannot filter those instincts. They have no inhibitions on those instincts. Um, you know, sadism has been often described as kind of limbically driven in the limbic system of our brain. It's, it's a kind of a fusion of the aggression instinct and, um, uh, you, you know, the reproductive instinct. So you get sexual sadism. Uh, so these instincts um, is what Mother Nature gave us. Uh, so, um, you know, we're kind of, all of us who are not serially killing are actually, uh, you know, freaks of nature. We've, we've shaken off the instincts that Mother Nature instilled in us for the benefits of a kind of community living. Um, yeah, you know, well, that's as good as any, I guess. I mean, for sure. So, I mean, let me ask you this. So, right now, in terms of what are the some of the main motivations that we have at least identified for these individuals? I mean, I'm assuming most of it is either sexual gratification or sexual frustration in some way. Not uh, at all. No, um, not at all. Certainly not sexual frustration. Um, you know, Ted Bundy, of course, would, would you know. Was a, he could you know get any girl he wanted. Uh -huh. uh, a serial killer I'm interviewing right now had uh, you know was 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 married with uh, three kids, um, had uh, two mistresses at the same time, okay. and and yet he was out uh, killing. So um, sex essentially is used by a serial killer as a weapon. Okay. Um, so. The main um, motivation is uh, power and control. Those are the two things that um, these pathologies thrive on. Um, power, control, revenge to some extent, although often it's not kind of a, a thought out revenge, mm -hmm. but mostly it's about power and control and, and rape. Um, the sexual element of it is just the way they express that power um, and, and, and control. What about um, individuals like, uh, well, I guess that would still fall under power, but what about somebody like uh, Munchausen by proxy or a mother kills yeah. all of her family members and yeah. she's doing it, uh, allegedly, she's doing it for that feeling, uh, that, that, um, that warmth of the emotion that comes to her that she gets from the morning uh is that am i am yeah. i off base on that well what, the attention what, yeah she, she gets so uh, you know we can say that that that's kind of a power seeking as well and she's she's kind of you know she feels that her life is meaningless she's mm -hmm. an insect in society and 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 so when she's raised to the status of um a mother who has tragically lost her child that kind of empowers her as well well okay so in terms of you know the the moving through society some of these people are are they live normally like you say they have wives they have they have mistresses they have children uh, yeah. and they're able to interact in society without detection yeah. bundy gacy btk uh 
are the better killers, are the better killers, the ones that are able to fake that normalcy better. Because some people, you can just look at them and you say, well, you seem kind of weird to me. You seem kind of off. Yes. Uh, yeah. But then there are others who, like Bundy, who, while when you see him on television, when I see some of these specials, I think there's no way you could not notice that that guy was weird. There's no way. Right. You could, right? There's no but with way. hindsight. Uh, and, and there was a, and there is a, a well-known incident where he, he, comes to the park, he takes somebody in the morning, he comes back to the park and takes somebody in the afternoon. Yes. And while that is in, while that is impressive, he's walking around with a canoe and, a, and an arm cast. And you think to yourself, where are you going with an arm cast and a canoe? How are you doing that? How does anybody believe that? So, but somehow he's able to work his way into that. So... It was, was a sailing boat, actually. Yeah. So, so a sailing boat then makes sense, right? You can sail with one arm. A canoe, you can't, but but a sailing boat. Right? So, so is that is that the logic behind it? How are, That's are the those... logic behind his, his that, that the, you're talking about those two abductions in, in, in that park, right? Right, uh, right. On so, the lake, yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing story, right? It, it is. I mean, so it's amazing to me that you can do that multiple times within one day what are you getting? What is he getting out of that? What are those killers uh, obtaining from that? I know that you said there's fantasy and they're kind of acting out their fantasy. What happens when yeah. they when they realize the fantasy? Well, the problem was is when you realize the fantasy, um, one becomes extremely disappointed by it. Yeah. Uh, in reality, and 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 so what happens with the serial killer? is um, he will try to improve on the realization of the fantasy. You know, oh, um, you know, one part of that fantasy was realized not in the way he had hoped. And, and so, you know, maybe the victim did something that was unexpected that he hadn't incorporated in his fantasy. So, so now he has to redo it from the beginning in the hope that, what he does will match perfectly the fantasy he has been nurturing sometimes since the age of five. I mean, some of these guys start fantasizing about killing and, and raping like at the age of five oh. in pre pubescence. Um, and, and, and so um, they've been, you know, the average age where a serial killer starts killing is around, um, you know, 27, 28. So that means if they start, let's say, you know, age of five are, are rare, but there have been cases, but let's say even at the age of 10. So we're talking about 18 years of nurturing and developing a fantasy mm -hmm. that often they use to give them comfort, right? Like serial killers as children are, are often very lonely. They're often rejected by their, their, their peers for various reasons. Um, and, and, and so they end up kind of finding comfort in these fantasies of revenge and control. Um, they eventually, when they hit puberty, consciously begin to uh, sexualize these fantasies. But um, statistically, on average, they won't act out that fantasy un until they hit around the age of 27, 28. And then... After all these years of, of uh, finding comfort in the fantasy, they've now entered the reality, and it's a bummer. Oh. It's nothing like their fantasy. And now they're fucked because they can't return yeah. back to the fantasy again. You know, they, they've experienced the reality. So the only direction they can go now is forward in this kind of obsession to improve upon their fantasy un until they're either um, apprehended or, as some serial killers do, they, they, they burn out. They realize, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll never get that nirvana that I've been fantasizing about. And, and they end up retiring the way mm -hmm. so many, you know, like the Green River Killer did, like the PTK did. Um, or, or, or they just go self-destructive in the way Bundy did. I mean, when you look at Bundy in, in his last weeks, he's, uh, you know, just this lurching oh my God. Yeah. monster. I mean, you would describe him at that point, a disorganized serial killer compared to the kind of careful organization and planning and, uh, you know, meticulousness that, that he had um you know in his earlier murders so you do see that in serial killers near the end jeffrey dahmer 
you know, Jeffrey Dahmer starts killing by the week eventually, right? And 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 so, um, or they they just give up. They they turn themselves in to the police the way Edmund Kemper did. I mean, Kemper realized that he always had wanted to kill his mother, so he kills his mother. He kills his mother's best friend, uh-huh. um, and then he surrenders to police. So he kind of self self cured himself essentially. Edmund Kemper probably. Probably after having killed his mother and done that with the intelligence that he seems to had, he may have actually cured himself and um, may have vanished forever without those co-ed murders being solved. So, do you think that kind of what I'm hearing is they, they there's kind of a there's an arc, right? So they 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 have the yep. fantasy here and then they they actually commit the first thing and and the person didn't enjoy it the way they fantasized that they would, yeah. so they have to try to do it again. And yeah. so maybe their technique gets better initially because they practice and they and they do a little bit better. But then, do you find that they always devolve? I mean, and, and just into into because, like you said, with with Bundy, with Bundy, at, at the end, he's he's stealing the exact same car that they're already looking for. You know, they're already yeah. looking for the Beetle. He's stealing the Beetle. He's he's using his real name. He's still calling himself Ted. He's breaking out of prison and immediately going to to the sorority and beating people and killing people. He completely devolved. Uh, so, do you find that that that's kind of the typical arc of the serial well, killer? Well, you know, there's nothing typical about any serial killer. Each one really is um, an individual psychology, and, mm-hmm. and 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 then you have just a chronology that's in it. I mean, some serial killers will reach that arc; others never never reach that arc. I mean, you know, now we're we're having serial killers who are essentially arrested before they become serial killers. Yeah. Uh, you know, you hear that term wannabe serial killer now because, um, you know, there's so many wannabe serial killers, but um, they don't quite pull it off on, on, on their first attempt and, and that's it. But when you look at their pathology um, and the kind of the build up to their fantasies, their past, you begin to realize that had these guys not, not screwed up their first um, murder, they, they, they would have gone on again and again. For how long, you know, it's, it's hard to say, but, but um, you know, not all serial killers reach that uh-huh. pinnacle uh, by the time, you know, before they're apprehended. So some are apprehended before. It's almost as if, uh, you know, when you think about it, it's almost as if like Ted Bundy's becoming kind of adopting the mentality almost the suicidal mentality of a, of a mass of a mass killer yeah right because often mass killers they have this kind of uh sudden catharsis um and often they're the last person to die uh it's it's almost a suicidal act and 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 so when you look at ted ted bundy's or 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 edmund kemper's last killing i mean once he killed his mother um he's no longer now you know, an anonymous serial killer. Now there's a link, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so not all serial killers will will reach that that point. Whether they all would, given enough time, you know, I can't speculate on is, that. Is it typically the more successful ones? Obviously, I mean, because you just mentioned Kemper and and the link. He finally killed somebody who was directly related to him, very close to yeah. him. Uh, and that's usually how most murders are solved. You know, it's the person closest to you right there in your circle that's right is that why serial killers first of all are are so difficult to catch at least back in the day they were much more difficult to catch because they're because of the of the random and um you know stranger quote unquote the stranger that's right uh, um they were also called um one of the terms was motiveless crimes right yeah Yeah. they're yeah they weren't trying to rob you they just wanted to kill you yeah Yeah, exactly what was the motive they were called thrill killers thrill murders to right people tried to ascribe some kind of vague motive to them but they could never put their 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 finger on and of course every serial killer you know they kill for different reasons Mm -hmm. in, in in different ways i mean there's there's kind of different when you get into the complexities of of, of their psychopathology there's there's different ways they express their control and express their past so uh, you know they're they're very rare serial killers so um you know i think overall we've in the world we we've kind of cataloged maybe 
5,000 serial killers. I mean, if, if, mm-hmm. if you look at, um, you, you know, the Radford serial killer database, they've collected about 5,000 um, cases of serial murder around the world. And I think uh, maybe 3,500 were in the United States. Uh, so that's still extraordinarily rare. And even if you say tripled again, that number, yeah. um, that still is not a lot. So it's a very rare phenomenon that we don't really understand and, and may never understand. So the predominant coverage to a serial killer goes to the white man. Why is that? Why are predominant... not anymore? So because you wrote a whole book about female serial killers. Yes, there are obviously serial killers of all race and creed. But yes. those those that golden age, those golden age of people typically are just white males. Yes. Predo- back then, yes, predominantly um, white males. Uh, any 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 idea of why that is? I mean, what, what what's the I think partly because um, there were probably more African-American serial killers mm-hmm. um, and and most murders are committed within your own race. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so we presume that African-American serial killers were killing African-American women. Uh, they were killing African-American women who were of the same category that often um, white female um, victims were. And, and that is, um, they were either prostitutes or mm-hmm. drug addicts or homeless or runaways and so forth. Right. Um, and, and so... Um, you know, I, I, I've been investigating a number of serial or just unsolved murders in New Jersey, and I'm discovering that um, the murders of African American women in New Jersey, even in the 1970s, were not as often reported in the new media as they were um, as were of, of white victims. So, um, I suspect there probably were more African American. Uh, serial killers and victims of serial killers, but they were, you know, journalists weren't drawn to those stories. They even aren't today. I mean, you know, despite the fact that now, of course, more serial killers are African-American. I think the number is like 62% um, than than whites. Um, So that partly has to do with a kind of a um, a media bias, media consciousness yeah. of, of uh, African American communities and, 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 and so forth. Um, you know, African American communities have built their own now media platforms as as as, as well. So, um, so there there you go. It, again, the media drives the story, right? I mean, and, and absolutely, the media has a How certain report, right? The media has a certain type that they're that they're that's going to lead. They think they'll get the most, you know, today they'd get the most clicks on, on social media. That's yeah. what they're going to, that's going they're going to run with. Yeah, I, absolutely. I have two more questions here and then we'll kind of meet at the, at the hour here. So if you could, who are some, who is a serial killer whose myth is just larger than the reality? You know, it gets a lot of pub, but in reality uh, is not, doesn't really deserve it. And then maybe secondarily, who is one of the more quote unquote interesting serial killers that the public really doesn't know about? Well, I'll answer the second question first. Is obviously okay. the guy that I'm working with right now, and, and this is the guy who I had encountered in in New York in 1979. Um, in 2017, some some uh, you know, 38 right. years later, I, I get to meet him uh, in prison, and and he's fascinating to me because one, he's brought up in a absolute normal. Um, a household, as, f- as far as I'm aware, unless he's covering something up. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, the family's intact. He has three younger sisters that adore him. Um, as I say, he was married. He uh, had three children. Um, he had, you know, all these mistresses in New York City. He lived in the, the suburbs of New Jersey. He would commute. He was gainfully employed in the same job for 14 years um, and yet he committed these you know torso murders I mean he was severing heads setting torsos on fire in New York hotel rooms I mean he was pretty wild as as a serial killer Um, so 
so it's fascinating just how absolutely um and what's his name again? untypical he is his name is richard cottingham cottingham the times square torso killer so in January, he had just confessed to three more murders going back to uh, 1968 and wow. 1969. Um, you know, he claims that he killed approximately 100 women. Oh, wow. Um, he's first, he's arrested for uh, five murders he commits between 1977 and 1980. And, and, and he goes away for 30 years and then in 2010 he confesses to a murder way back in 1967 uh 10 years before that first series of murders and 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 basically says you know there's a lot more there there's a hundred uh and and then when you do the math uh between let's say 1967 his earliest confirmed murder in 1980 his oldest uh his latest confirmed murder uh, you know, we're talking 13, 14 years. Mm -hmm. That means maybe one murder every six weeks. Yeah. That's entirely doable, especially in the 1970s when, when he was doing it and the 1960s. All right. So he actually was Ted Bundy before um, there was Ted Bundy. He used the same ruse pretending to be a, a, a cop uh -huh. um, abducting women from shopping malls from the parking lot using a fake, you know, cop badge, except rather than get them in his own car, he would get into the victim's car and, and then force her to drive somewhere where he would uh, rape and kill her. So he only received 30 years for those five? No, he, he no, no, he received a uh, life sentence. Oh, okay. It was just 30, 30, years 30 years later. into his sentence, okay. he's, he started confessing, right? Okay, and 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 that's interesting too because I, I I think what happens is in the case of psychopathy we're beginning to think that you know that may be one explanation why they start killing in kind of late age is um, the kind of compulsions you are driven by um, you know your testosterone begins to fail in your middle ages right. fades um, and and so apparently um, psychopaths begin to for the lack of a better term, um, kind of mellow out once they hit their 50s. So that may be one explanation why they retire if they haven't been, you know, abduct, uh, haven't been apprehended. Um, it also, it seems to me in the case with, with Richard Cunningham is he's, he's clearly a, a psychopath. No, um, he has no sense of remorse but he's developed what I would describe as cognitive remorse. He understands what it is. Uh -huh. He understands how it's appropriate for him to um, act on remorse, right. to show remorse. Um, you know, he is a, a practicing Catholic, so, so there is that aspect. He's now 73. He's beginning to face his mortality. And, and and so partly his confessions are, are, are being driven by, as I say, an intellectual cognitive remorse. He understands that this is the right thing to do, even though he doesn't feel it in his heart. You know, he tells me, I don't feel this, but I know what I did is terrible. And, and, and you know, I want to fix it as, as any way I can. I just don't feel it, though. And you don't pick up from him that he has any that there that these confessions are driven by any type of ego or uh, the no. need to be to need to, to be more famous and get my name out no, there. More. No, 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 absolutely. None of that. The, the fame is the last thing he wants. I mean, this guy, you know, the reason we don't know him, this is a guy who's born uh, 24 hours after Ted Bundy was born. Wow. Uh, you know, the next day after Ted Bundy. Yeah. Right? He's born uh, November 25th. Ted Bundy was born, uh, I think, November 24th, 1946. Um, and nobody has heard of Richard Cottingham. Right, yeah. All right. Uh, and, and because the moment he went away in 1980, never gave a single interview, nothing. Until, like I said, 2010, he, he starts... I mean, is coming there, forward. Is there anybody that did, that they would, they would consider again to go back to the first question that would consider a, a serial killer who 
you know, the, the myth of them is, is beyond what they actually did. Maybe like a Charles Manson. Do they consider Charles Manson a serial killer? I would consider Charles Manson a cult serial killer. Okay. Um, you know, he certainly motivated people to right. commit these murders. So, so he always seemed overrated yes. to me because you know he didn't actually physically commit anything. Yeah. Allegedly, he had some mental control over some drugged out children and and convinced them and talked them into to doing these deeds for him potentially. Yeah. And it depends on who you talk to because but he boy he he made the most of that. He was that fame seeking. He was charismatic. I mean, yes. he's impressive, Charles Manson. He's a great poet. Yeah. Um, he speaks certain truths, you know, mm -hmm. his line about, you know, the, you know, children coming at you with knives, they're your children. He's 100% right. Right. Uh, you know. um, but, but, you know, as someone once commented, um, you know, Charlie Manson had a way of taking a truth and turning it into a lie. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so that tells me a lot about, you know, Charlie Manson. Yeah, um, you know he's very charismatic. You got to give him that. So, um, you know, certainly as a, but I don't think anybody really looks at him as as a certainly not as a traditional right. serial sure. killer. But but as a cult figure that that made crime history, cult history. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't overrate Charlie Manson okay. that much. You know, Charlie don't surf. <laughs> Okay, so so my final question then, and and is the day with with the social media that we have now, with the DNA um, improvements that we have now, and we talked about, I mentioned that the Golden State Killer, how, and I watched something I guess it was twenty twenty, and they yep. talked about how they they pulled DNA from the scene. They had no DNA of him. They didn't know it was him, but they traced him back from some member of his extended family, and they were able to isolate that guy thirty yep. years later. And and they nail and they nailed him, and and then again with the social media, the instant national coverage worldwide is the day of that truly prolific serial killer over. I mean, is it to the point where you you're not going to get away with it the way you used to? Well, it appears uh, you know that indeed serial killers are not getting away yeah. with it the way they used to. I mean, the average number of victims has dramatically dropped from what it used to be in, mm -hmm. in the 70s, 80s. I mean, you had 9 to 12 victims was the average um, in the 1980s. They, they've dropped significantly to like, I think, four to six victims now. So that indicates that they're getting captured earlier right. in their career. Um, I think the ubiquity of cell phones and um, video, I mean, that's where the way Israel, Key, Israel Keys was was hunted down by 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 video essentially right they saw mm -hmm. him on on video cameras the description of his vehicle that led to a, a kind of apb that um you know he was stopped in texas for a murder he had uh, an abduction and murder he had committed in alaska wow uh, but they managed to like i say get him in in in, in texas so um, the ubiquity of cell phones not only carried by a serial killer but by the victim as well and of course you know all homicide investigations are linking um a a victim with the perpetrator and, and, and what can more uh, than generously link you is, you know, the two cell phones that the perpetrator is carrying and the one that the victim is carrying. Right. And, and so um, DNA technology as well, um, awareness um, in, in, in police departments of just the phenomenon of serial murder. A lot of cops in the 70s just couldn't believe that a single person could commit that many murders. So right. You had this problem of linkage blindness. Um, so, so that's the optimistic prognosis is, is, you know, we now have all this data. In other words, you know, you are going to be on a surveillance video before you even thought of committing a crime, right? Right. Um, you are ready on that video, and then you decide you're going to commit a crime afterwards, right? But you're on video already. Uh, it's ubiquitous. So that's that's you know one problem now is is that all this evidence is being just randomly generated automatically. You you can't search anything on the internet. 
you know, and, and you know, unless you cloak your searches. Right. So, so all our movements now are are are, are tracked. And defense attorneys have been complaining to me, you know, these days that whenever they're defending a murderer, you know, cops bury them in like cell phone data, which a defense attorneys can't even, especially if you're, you know, a public defender, you can't afford to hire an analyst to. Um, you know, crunch all that cell phone right. data that um, a prosecutor is um, arguing is going to be evidence against your clients. So, so th- that partly, I think, is is um, the reason we seem to have this decline. Overall, murders, just ordinary murders, have dramatically dropped since now, since 1995, essentially, yeah. um, as well. Um, and, and, and so the only pessimistic response to that is, is that maybe serial killers have become more forensically aware and smarter mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, don't carry a cell phone or, or, um, you know, take measures and, uh, probably some, some do, but, you know, Israel keys was supposed to be like that, but then in the end he gets caught anyway, eventually right. they'll get caught no matter how clever they, they, they think they are. By the way, um, your question about who might be the most overrated serial killer, uh-huh. um, I, I would throw back very quickly uh, Jack the Ripper. Um, okay. This idea that da- Jack the Ripper was some kind of aristocrat or, um, you know, he was related to the queen or or there was a, you know, uh, he was a doctor, all, all that stuff. You know, he's always like a member of the upper, upper classes, right? right? He probably was a local um, you know, j- judging from kind of if you profile those crimes the way you would today, he probably was a local schlub living in that neighborhood, um, slaving away as much as his victims were. All right. Well, there, there you go. That that's definitely because that fits right in. Right there, there is no myth bigger than than Jack the Ripper. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, thank you so much, uh, Peter, for joining the show tonight. Before we sign off, I know you had mentioned that you have a brand new book coming out in December. Are there any other projects that you're working on currently that you'd like to take a moment and and plug? No, um, it's um, you know the whatever I'm going to do with Richard Cottingham is going to be a book, but but a good two years down the line. Okay. Uh, but like I said, my next major thing that's coming out December: um, American Serial Killers, uh, the Epidemic Years, nineteen. 19- 50 to 1960, December 8th. It's already available for pre-sales on uh, Amazon and other websites as well. Awesome. That sounds great. Once again, that's Dr. Peter Vronsky. And you can check out his work on his website, petervronsky.org, and again, amazon.com. So once again, um, Peter, I really appreciate you spending some time with me. I, I Again, this, the, the serial killers have, have legs. It's something that people really enjoy uh, listening to and talking about. It captures the imagination, and I I appreciate you coming on with me. Peter, thanks for having me on. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. So there you have it. Again, that's Dr. Peter Vronsky. We were talking serial killers, and uh, I do think it's interesting. He thinks that Jack the Ripper was overrated. I can can see that. Uh, You know, you do. It is one of the, the most researched, discussed, written about, uh, serial killer um, uh, scenarios in history, and uh, he he finds that to be the most overrated. And you know, it's it's all real interesting to figure out and to try to to assign um, motive and and a relationship between the way people were brought up to the the actions that they take later in life. Problem I have with that is again. There are millions upon millions upon millions of people who are born, who are raised, who suffer trauma as a ch- as a child, who had a, a an absent father or a distant father, had an overbearing mother, had a lot of those same um, challenges to overcome, and they aren't out killing people. Uh, so there has to be some defect initially in the person. Uh, so. Something in them has to be broken to start. And then when you layer on some of those risk factors, then you may get to the point where now, because again, like we talked about, they may not understand that there's anything wrong with what they're doing. Uh, You know, I can kill people if I want. It's okay. They don't have those same level of empathy or that same uh, realization of right and wrong that the rest of us do. 
So they just go on keep it on and uh you know eventually they get to the point where they work up work themselves up to that point where they can make that fantasy a reality i truly believe that um dr vronsky is correct you know the 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 reality never equals the fantasy especially if you're looking at this as a sexual thing and you know there's a sexual component to your control over this person maybe they you want you were in your fantasy they enjoy it and in reality nobody enjoys typically being strangled to death or killed so then you have to try again and try something different. And um, uh, I don't know. It's all, so, it's all so morbid to even discuss. But you know, what are your thoughts? Are there serial killers out there that you think are overrated? You know, who are you most interested in? Is it Ed Kemper who, by all accounts, probably did cure himself? He, had, he killed people as a surrogate for who he really wanted to kill. And then eventually when he finally had the realization – that I really want to kill my mother and did that, that cured uh, the, the overall urges that he had. And maybe it wasn't so much that he had those urges. Maybe he wasn't all that different from the rest of us. He just really wanted to kill his mom, and as weird as that sounds. And he did not have the guts or the ability at that time to do so, so he acted out that on someone else, and those poor unfortunates. Um, by all accounts, you know, he's a genius man. He's got, a, I think, a 145 IQ. Uh, and so, again, just turned himself in after he finally killed his mother. He had accomplished his mission. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Once again, you can contact us through our email address. It's provemewrongcast at gmail.com. You can let us know who your favorite, quote unquote, favorite. It's really weird to say, who's your favorite killer? Who's the person you really love to talk about? Who killed people? Uh, is it Ed Gein who turned people's skin into lampshades or, or, you know, Buffalo Bill character in Silence of the Lamb was based on him? Or was it Ed Kemper who was six foot nine and just a monster of a man? Uh, or was it Ed Jeff Dahmer who was killing and eating people? Or was it that Ted Bundy who was just uh, the face of an altar boy, but he's a monster? I don't know. Um, send us an email. Let us know. You can also... Drop us a line on Facebook or Instagram. Prove Me Wrong is the name of the of the show. Just search by that. You'll be able, be able to find us. If you're just looking for content and how to find the show, we are on Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, SoundCloud, iTunes, really any podcast app where you get your podcast, you can find Prove Me Wrong. Like and subscribe to the page, and you will be notified when a brand new episode comes out. We typically release them once a week. So you'll be notified when a brand new episode, just like this one, is released, and you can be the first to hear it. We're also on YouTube. Here's the YouTube scroll right here. Like and subscribe to the Prove Me Wrong YouTube page. Once again, you will be notified of uh, the next uh, episode that has been released. You can be the first one to download and to watch the episode where I have guests like Dr. Peter Vronsky. Um, before we go, Java Remix is one of our sponsors tonight. Java Remix is the perfect blend of 100% organic Arabica coffee. It's infused with nano emulsified CBD. You can start your day off on the right foot with a great tasting cup of coffee with all the demonstrated benefits of pure CBD. Java Remix also offers traditional ground coffee as well as single serve K-cups in both regular and decaf. And if you aren't a coffee person, Java Remix offers CBD infused teas, and even beauty products like bath bombs and body scrubs. As an added benefit for our Prove Me Wrong listeners, if you go online right now, javaremix.com, and you enter the code Prove Me Wrong, you'll get a 20% discount off of your entire shopping experience. Java Remix also offers free shipping for all orders over $40, so you don't have any reason not to give it a shot. Once again, that is javaremix.com, promo code Prove Me Wrong. The Prove Me Wrong podcast is brought to you tonight by Zendozone Citronella Burners from J.T. Eaton. They're shaped like fearless bug-repellent tiki gods. So you can let Surf and Stan, Hawaiian Howie, and Luau Lily bring the islands to your backyard with Zendozone Citronella Burners. Zendozone uses natural 3% citronella candles and incense cones, and they're perfect for patios, decks, backyards, campsite, poolside, and more. You can enjoy the outdoors again. They're available at Amazon.com and at select Ace Hardware stores. So go ahead and collect them all today. 
once again for my guest tonight, Dr. Peter Voronsky. Uh, PeterVoronsky.org is his website. I am Pete Lieb. This is the Proof Me Wrong Podcast. We hope to talk to you again soon.